Hi, my name is Cody Smith. I am one of the teaching assistants for the spring 2019 semester of Introduction to Deep Learning. Welcome to the course. Uh, I will be taking the place of the professor for this very important lecture zero on lo course logistics uh, because our professor has unfortunately had a slight injury and is out for the moment. Um, this lecture is about defining this course at a, at a sort of rules and uh, information kind of level. It's a very important lecture because uh, it will let you know sort of um, how the course is structured, where the points are, what your resources are, what to do in certain situations. It sort of defines the game itself of, of the course. Uh, as for the course itself, we'll be talking a little bit about what's in the course and the level of difficulty. And again, some of the resources that uh, and expectations that will be imposed upon you for this particular class. So with uh, no more further ado, let's get into it. So neural networks are a big subject. They are absolutely becoming a increasingly more important part of the computer science curriculum. And uh, I, I am one of the Silicon Valley um, TAs, and I can tell you that living in the Bay Area it is one of those skills that is becoming, uh, it's, it's moving from something that's being sought after to being something that is actually expected of, of a prospective college uh, graduate, at least from a university like CMU. So neural networks are everywhere, they're becoming literally, I, I, would, I would personally call them a fourth paradigm of programming, a, a fourth way to program. Um, and they're going just generally becoming increasingly important in the world. We've had a lot of different sort of breakthroughs with neural networks. Um, we've seen a lot of breakthroughs in speech recognition. We've also seen um, breakthroughs in translation as well as image recognition. And we've even seen breakthroughs, here's a, an example of some um, vision-based um, networks doing their thing. So you can see the network identifying the cars here, and uh, this is probably an offline simulation, but um, it's, it's quite impressive how accurately this can be done, um, and how consistently with the right net types of networks and the right compute power behind those networks. More recently, and this is something that's fascinating to me, uh, we saw a team at Google actually beat the world champion Go player. Um, there's a documentary about this, I think it's on Netflix, but it's out there called AlphaGo uh, that is fantastic. I, I'm not supposed to endorse any products, but if, if you have some time, I highly recommend watching this if you get the chance, because um, it talks about not just not just the team that created the, the program, but also, or the network, or the so sort of the infrastructure with the networks that that uh, make it go, but it also talks about the player and, and, and details the tournament. Very interesting stuff. And, um, you know, this is go right up there with um, a number of different sort of game-based milestones that uh, have been used to sort of show the world where artificial intelligence is and what it can do. Um, I would say um, chess, be beating the Grandmaster in chess, the IBM's effort at... Um, beating the best Jeopardy players and AlphaGo are sort of like very large historical milestones in the progression of AI. Uh, and I want to be clear here, I, it's, AI is not about you know playing games and beating them, but games are fun, people understand games, and when we can use the AI, the sophisticated tools that we've developed to, or in this case neural networks, to uh, accomplish these tasks, we, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to show the world as a sort of uh, bar of sorts that this is what we can do um, with these technologies, or at least this is where we're at in some understandable way. Now Go is considered to be one of the more complicated games out there. It's actually generally considered to be the, the most complicated in terms of the number of different possible moves and board configurations and things like that, at least in the board gaming space. So this was a big accomplishment. And it was relatively recently, a couple a couple of years ago. Um, we've also seen big advances in uh, perception and understanding. So this is a um, uh, related to a, a field that I actually did a project in last semester called VQA. This is not VQA. This is slightly different. This is um, presenting a neural network with an image and asking that network to generate a description of what's in the image. 
VQA is actually slightly more complicated where you pose the network, not just an image, but a, qu a question about the image in text format, and then uh, you get a text-based answer. It's very interesting and touches a lot of different domains that, uh, that we'll be talking about in this class. Um, so huge probability space or, prob or sort of uh, what I would call like a splash zone for neural networks. There's a lot of different problems that this technology can be used to address um, or at least partially address as part of a more complicated system. You can think of a neural network not unlike a function in that uh, it can be they can be used inside of larger programs that do more complicated things. It can be mixed and matched with other types of programming, other paradigms of programming, I should say. Um, and you know, right now the, it's it's a very hot topic. Um, the there's a lot of different problems that are left out there that can be solved using this technology, although it is still considered somewhat of a hammer. And so if, if there is a more efficient mechanism to solve a problem, um, sometimes that's the right answer. So some, there are definitely problems out there in that sort of problem space that um, may, may be suited better with more traditional methods. Um, but it's exciting to have another tool in our arsenal, even if it is a hammer, um, to, to potentially solve some of these problems that in many cases were thought unsolvable by traditional programming. Um, and of course, again, I can speak to this from the Silicon Valley background. I've been in the Bay Area for a year now, and I can say that this is definitely a true slide that we, uh, in the, in at least, so if you look at the, um, in the master's program, the, when you accept the, the program as someone not from CMU, like, like I did, um, they give you a brochure that shows where prospective CMU master's graduates go after they uh, graduate. And about 90 some odd percent of them ended up literally in the Bay Area. So um, I can tell you for sure that those of you who come out here, and a lot of you probably will, that um, those of you who have deep learning and neural networks or even any sort of AI, ML background, will find it easier to attain a job and you will fetch higher salaries for sure. So course objectives. This is a very, very, very well put together course. Um, it, it can be an introductory level course if you are very ambitious and, and if you, so if, you, if I came in last semester not knowing anything about really really not completely understanding anything about networks um, and uh, I, I was able to you know scoop up a lot of knowledge in this domain um, and I'm still learning of course but um, for those of you who have some experience it'll be a little easier of course so so if, if you're coming in with no no domain experience um, you know strap in is my suggestion but for those of you who have some experience this is going to be a great class to fill out that breadth of knowledge and uh, it will put you in a very competitive place uh, having completed the course and going to look for internships and things like that. Now, um, the professor's objectives here are bold in my opinion. He really wants to cover um, not just sort of the introductory concepts but he, he quickly wants to get into higher concepts and, and, and then fill out what the field entails, like what can be done in this field at this point. Um, his grading standards are such that, you know, if you get an A in the course, you're essentially an expert in machine learning, or at least you are up there with the best. If you get a B in the course, you are ready for a job in ML or an internship in ML. Um, so that's sort of where the bars are set. And uh, I would argue that those bars are, are aptly set for that criteria. So essentially, when you come into this course, if you don't know about networks, you will understand neural networks by the end of it. And you will be able to do what I would call dangerous things. I don't mean actually dangerous things, but I mean you will know enough to really sincerely be able to go and solve ML problems um, by the time you're done with this course, a single course. Um, if you know a lot about networks, this is going to pave over your knowledge and experience in a way that will make you a lot more confident and 
also, depending upon where you land in your in the grade uh, curve, it will indicate to you whether or not you are ready for an internship or ready for a job in machine learning. So broad level, um, we are going to, he starts out um, surprisingly low level. And so we, we will talk about a single neuron and the history behind it and, and sort of where where this field started, which I loved that part of this class. It was extremely informative and I love the story uh, of sorts. I love to understand um, how we got where we are. And we will break into a large number of concepts. Um, we will talk about training and um, a lot of the math behind gradient descent and backprop in detail. Uh, we'll talk about the architecture of the network. And towards the end of the class, we'll shift into a mode where we will actually um, start to see guest speakers and we'll start to talk about more specific types of networks um, that are that are less generic and more specific. Uh, so sort of think, you know, the tree fanning out a little bit, uh, which is very good. Um, although it is easier to get lost in that area, so just be warned. Um, so we'll talk about MLPs, convolutional networks, recurrent networks, um, Boltzmann net machines, um, BAEs, gains, things like this. These are all topics that are big in ML. If, if you, you're going to be in two camps. Either you understand what these are and good for you, and it'll, it's, it'll, be, it'll be good to formally understand them and talk about them and, 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 and discuss them and, and analyze them. Or if you don't know what these are, these are all going to be like, you know, mind-blowing ideas that are going to open you up to sort of um, the tools within ML that you can use to uh, create networks and, and, and train them and things like that and different kinds of ways of approaching these problems. It's very interesting. We'll talk about some computer vision. Um, so there, there is a section of this course on CNNs that gets into that a little bit. Um, there'll be a lot of text processing and a lot of um, audio processing in this course. The homeworks focus on that um, quite a bit. So a number of the homeworks are based on um, uh, uh, text and speech based sort of uh, context. So um, lots of um, processing articles, generating strings, things like that. Um, so we'll definitely hit, hit that quite, uh, quite well. Uh, if that's if that's something you're into, um, there is another course that is more. Uh, it's my understanding that is more uh, computer vision sort of heavy, um, so that may be something that you're interested in after this course, or maybe something that you do in parallel. I don't know. Um, that's up to you. So there will be a list of books on the course webpage um, that. Um, are sort of form additional readings that are um, it's 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 good to know it's it's good to have and, and a number of the homeworks that'll help you complete them faster and easier and you'll have a better understanding of what it is that you're actually doing. In addition to that, um, we have a number of TAs in this class, like a number of TAs. Um, it's it's a big class. It's it was um, almost 500 people last semester, and I think we're getting pretty close to that this semester. So, um, these TAs will be holding office hours um, in both Pittsburgh and Silicon Valley, and I think uh, come with some of the other campuses as well. <clears throat> um, uh, but in addition to that, we will also be so uh, available. Uh, on Piazza. So we'll talk about that in a little bit here, but um, at any time during the course you will be able to post on Piazza and expect, at least during normal sort of operating hours, um, a pretty quick reply, hopefully, if, if everything's working right. Um, and a number of the problems that you'll face will be addressed there. So we'll be having lots of conversations on Piazza for sure. Um, okay, so um, the class is taught at the Pittsburgh campus, um, and it is broadcast to the other campuses um, like a live stream, essentially. Now, you can post questions during the live stream on Piazza, um, but what most people do is they, uh, if you're not able to make the real lectures, the, the, you know, the, the live lectures, then um, the recordings will be posted and so, like for me, and um, you know, with the 9 a.m. lecture last semester, uh, 
in Silicon Valley time, that's 6 a.m. It, it's too early. So I would regularly catch the lectures in the form of recordings thereafter. It's very important that you actually watch these lectures, though. Um, it, students do have a tendency to start skipping lectures towards the end of the class, especially um, in favor of just doing the homework and the work and things like that. This class has weekly quizzes, and the quizzes are configured such that um, a some of the questions will be based on content that's only in the actual lectures, like only in the recordings, and some of the content is only in the slides. So there are slides that are not included um, as part of the presentation, but they're in the slide deck. Uh, so you'll definitely want to make sure that every week you're watching both of the lectures, the recitation, and the and actually reading through the slides. Now, one of the things that I can say. Um, about the recitations while I'm here is the recitations are more to help you with the homeworks. Um, that is, you know, not explicitly their stated goal, but that's where what you're going to find them useful for is, is helping you understand what the setup and procedure and sort of where the pitfalls are in the homework assignments. It's, it's where recitations are led by the TAs, and it's um, and we also help organize the homework, and so we're in a position where we've been there, done that, seen it and we can help you not fall into some of the same um, uh, pits or issues or have some of those same problems that we did uh, last semester. So, um, you know, the, the time that you might save with the recitations by not watching them is going to be, you're, you're going to pay it back in, in your struggle to complete the homeworks, guaranteed. So you definitely want to make sure you watch those. Okay, um, the primary place to find information about the course, um, what's going on, is going to be the course website. Um, having said that, though, the uh, a number of announcements will be posted on uh, Piazza. We do have a Canvas page, but Piazza will be used as the primary place to post announcements about the course. Um, Canvas will mostly be used for grade tracking and for the quizzes. So just I'm helping you understand the landscape here. You'll probably want to have a link to Piazza saved in your browser somewhere. You'll probably want to have a link to um, the course site saved in your browser somewhere. You're probably going to want to have a link to the um, site where the videos are posted. We'll, we'll post that on Piazza later. Um, you'll want to have a couple of these links saved away so that you can check them regularly, uh, but particularly Piazza. Now, again, if you want to look ahead and see what the readings are or look ahead and see what the next week's lecture is going to be or, or whatever, if you're looking for dates and times, that's going to be the course site. Um, we'll keep that up to date uh, as we go through the semester. Again, later on in the class, we will have some guest lectures. Those will be announced on the course site uh, and things like that. Okay, recitations. Um, we will have 13 recitations. Um, we will cover lots of things in those recitations, everything from AWS to uh, up getting up and running with PyTorch to you know, specific examples for each homework that are sort of related to uh, the task that you are going to be asked to do in those homeworks. Those are going to be uh, TA-led recitations, and they are strongly recommended that you attend all of them uh, regularly on time. Again, they will be held in the Pittsburgh campus and recorded and archived for the rest of the class who can't make it. Or so that anyone who can't make it physically to the Pittsburgh campus or, or is based in one of the other satellite campuses. This is our recitation schedule. Um, you can see that we'll start with AWS, and as we progress through the course, um, the recitations typically lag a little bit behind the lectures, but they follow the general flow of the course um, as, as it unfolds. Um, so oftentimes the professor will be talking about something in, in lecture, and then we'll be following that up with more specific code examples and, and, and sort of a nuts and bolts approach in the recitations. Okay, grading. So this is an extremely important slide. Um, this is going to detail how the course is obviously uh, scored. So there will be 14 weekly quizzes. Um, the bottom two quizzes will be dropped. So that's one quiz per week, two dropped. That will account for 24% of the uh, actual marks in this class. There will be five homework assignments, um, but one of them is kind of a, I don't want to say a give me, but it's not worth as much as the rest. It's, it's very much a preparatory homework. 
that's homework zero you guys should already be working on that at this point um homeworks typically like you can see two three and four come in the flavor of having an auto lab component and a Kaggle component so they're not really one homework assignment they're really two homework assignments they're just bundled together the auto lab portion um, has discrete knowable solutions so we have a code that is able to test the code that you provide and in theory there should be a common answer our answer should be the same as your answer the Kaggle competitions are just that they're competitions they are um, data sets that you'll be given and you will not be getting the same exact answers that we will your network will produce some percentage of a correct answer and that percentage will rank you within that Kaggle competition and then we will use cutoff points that are typically decided upon per homework based on previous years scores to decide who will get what letter grade for that portion of the homework so as you can see, overall, there's five homework assignments, four of which are worth 12.5% of your grade, or this sort of are, are um, <clears throat> substantial, I guess you could say. It's all substantial, but you know they're very substantial. Um, and I, I will warn you right now, and we'll have slides in this, but I will warn you that those homeworks are extremely difficult. I, you you uh, will spend the majority of your time in this class on those particular assignments. Um, but you will also learn the most. So anything you can do to reduce the struggle on those assignments is going to be a big win for you. Um, and that's where the recitations come in. That's where the additional reading comes in. That's where uh, being on the ball and understanding what's going on uh, will help you. And also we're taking advantage of the TA's physical office hours as well as their uh, the, the um, <coughs> Piazza office hours will be uh, very useful to you. Um, finally, for the graduate version of this class, 11, 8, 7, 11, 7, 8, 5, um, there will be a final project. This will be a group project. Um, it will come in the form of a group with, I think it's up to four members, and it will go, it's your typical, you know, write a paper, make a poster, present the findings, you know, go, go do graduate school stuff. Um, so you'll be a proposal, you'll propose a project um, based upon, in part, a list of um, available, or not, not available, but possible starting points. Um, you'll have a midterm report, which could be in the form of a paper, and then finally you'll generate a poster, a large format poster, and a final report in, in the form of um, a template, you know, an overleaf kind of thing. Um, so that will account overall for 25% of your grade. Again, that's a group project, so um, it, it, it won't be like every group project. You know, part of that assignment is is the logistics of working together with a group of people, um, but it also means some of the work can be split. So it's I would put the group project, you know, pretty pretty close to an additional homework assignment's worth of work per person. Uh, if you're doing it correctly. So the exact breakdown on those points is TBD. We'll, we'll get back to you on that. Um, but know that the group project is worth 25% of your grade. If you're taking the non-graduate version of this course, there is no group project. And the proportional, you just have to scale the 75% the up to 100% and you'll, you'll know your grade. Cool. So the weekly quizzes. There are typically 10 to 12-ish sort of uh, questions on each quiz. We try to keep it around 10. They are related to what we're covering that week, and in theory, they should be findable within, not findable, but they should be derivable in the lecture material and the slide material. Um, the, we will try our hardest to get those quizzes released on Friday, although it has been the case that um, a couple of times the quizzes have been a little bit delayed, so don't worry too much if that's the case. You'll have the same amount of time to complete it no matter what. Um, so if it's delayed, we'll give you that time back for sure. Um, again, there's 14 total quizzes, 12 of which will be actually considered, so you can think of two of those as being dropped. Um, and uh, those two that are dropped are there as sort of... Um, 
understanding between the professor and the students that life is life and sometimes you may have something come up or you know need a break or just you know maybe you do all the quizzes and, and you just want to drop the lowest two of course so those two are, are quizzes dropped are meant to sort of account for uh, the variability of people's schedules and needs okay so um, again we talked about this but the lectures and quizzes have a weird intersection where the quizzes will encompass some material that uh, may only be findable in the lecture or it may only be findable in the slides or it may be findable in both um, so you definitely want to when you're doing the quizzes also or preferably beforehand also look at the slides and absorb that material um, the best of your ability uh, I find it's best to go through the lectures with the slides up and follow along and if you if you're watching the, the, the recorded lectures you can pause and read the additional slides if you need to um, so just be sure that you are definitely looking at the slides and the actual lectures for the quiz content or for when, when you are attempting to do the quizzes. Okay, so let's talk about homeworks. Um, they come in two flavors. We talked about this. There are auto lab homeworks, which will have deterministic solutions, um, which essentially, again, means that, you know, regardless of implementation details, our answer should be pretty close to your answer and will be checked as such. Uh, this can be difficult because there are situations where it, it is possible to arrive at slightly different answers having relatively comparable um, code. So um, a little bit of that is sort of, um, you know, not just trying to have correct your code that functions correctly, but also trying to do, do it in an efficient way that would mirror what someone else using the same frameworks would do. Um, so for example, uh, you know, in homework zero, we encourage you not to use loops. We encourage you to use uh, vector-based operations from NumPy because that's the efficient way you would solve that. And it turns out that if you use loops, you will come to slightly different issues because of round, so you come to slightly different answers because of rounding errors and things like that. So. Um, turns out that, technically speaking, if you do it the wrong way, you, you might actually not pass the test. Um, so just be aware of that. The Kaggle problems are different. Um, they are competitions where essentially the class will uh, be competing on a leaderboard um, for trying to get the highest score, or, or, or well, I mean, highest scores is a misnomer. Sometimes you're looking for the lowest actual score. but the point is that you're trying to compete with your other classmates to generate networks that get um, more more desirable answers that will be measured in different ways for different homeworks in general um, uh, if you in general if you you know you can you can in general you engage your 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 grade on those Kaggle competitions based upon where you are in the leaderboard um, but more specifically, as the homework progresses, cutoff points will be chosen, and those will equate to letter grades, and everything will be sort of linearly interpret, ter lerped, if you will, um, between between those cutoffs, um, to, uh, more or less. So, grading scale wise, um, you know, you can expect uh, something along the following. So, you know, typical grading scale. Um, for not just um, so for your cutoffs and Kaggle as well as it's, uh, the auto lab problems, um, the specifics of how the Kaggle and auto lab will be weighted is something like within those twelve and a half percent points for each homework is something that may be decided uh, towards the end of the class. It was last semester. Okay, so um, deadlines. There are multiple deadlines for each homework. Um, there is going to be an early submission deadline um, for a number of different homework assignments. Um, this is to encourage you to start working sooner. Um, it is very important that you not wait until the end to complete a homework assignment. It is extremely important that you 
um, ha have progressed to certain points before the and before the actual deadline for the homework so that you have chances to refine your work and do better so for the Kaggle competitions in particular um, there's an expectation that you will have some kind of score posted and not like a you know zero percent I mean like an actual score um, before an initial deadline and there are penalties involved with that um, <clears throat> the late policy is a little bit complicated in this class you have a number of slack days that you may use um, over the course of the class. So each um, part of each homework will count towards a slack day. So if you must delay beyond the stated due date of the homework for both parts, you will start to eat double slack days. So like you, generally speaking, um, you should generally start with part one, finish it, start with part two, finish it. But sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes you need to get on the board for part two because it has an initial uh, deadline or something along those lines. Seven slack days. Um, and logistically, this is actually pretty complicated for us to pull off as well. But um, generally speaking, if I were you, I would try to not have to use them. And then uh, when you do have to use them, at least you know you have them. If you have met the initial... Um, Okay, so once you once you use up all your slack days, all subsequent late submissions will occur a 10% penalty um, on top of the other penalties. Um, and once you're once so so essentially, um, this is just one of those areas where you know you're going to lose points if you eat up those slack days. Um, so use them wisely, I guess. Um, generally speaking, though, it's not too hard to complete these homework assignments in time um, if you are starting early. So my, my real recommendation with this slide is to um, sincerely start the homeworks as soon as you are able to start them and get to a place where you're comfortable with your progress well before the deadline. Um, and the, uh, the one thing with the Kaggle competitions, too, is be careful because the leaderboard changes over time. Other students are also trying to get better scores. So be aware that if, if you're one of the first to post on the board and you get a good score, like relative to who's on there so far, that may not mean that your score is actually good in the long run. So um, you know, keep checking back and make sure that you understand where you're at and, and how that's going to affect you because, again, it is that part of the class is kind of competitively graded in the sense that we are going to pick the cutoffs um, based upon what people are getting in those results. Okay, so um, it's implementation heavy. It really is. Uh, our, you know, it's good. Tr we're going to work with some very large data sets, and that that will pose problems for people in this class. It's it's part of the challenge of the course is to work with real world size data sets that are huge um, and that's also where you get some of the power of, of deep learning from is the fact that these network these that the training sets themselves are relatively large um, we will be using python as the programming language of choice um, like you pretty much have to know python if you're going to do this course um, and the toolkit of choice is pytorch so um, if you struggle with homework zero because you are still picking up Python, uh, that would be um, quite possibly a bad sign. I mean, I, I don't want to get into that too much, but you know, you should have a pretty good grasp of Python at this point already. Uh, PyTorch, you don't necessarily, I mean, from my experience, you can be new to PyTorch and complete this course no problem. Uh, it's a lot of effort, you're going to learn a lot of things, but don't worry about that one too much. But do know that we are going to be using PyTorch, um, not TensorFlow um, or anything else. It's, it's mostly PyTorch. Although we are going to be using TensorBoard, uh, which is a it's sort of a um, logging tool for neural networks. So, um, and I do believe you are allowed in the Kaggle competitions to use um, 
your toolkit of choice. So if you want to use TensorFlow or Keras or whatever, you can, but do be aware that uh, less of the TAs will be able to help you. So if you run into a problem using that toolkit for the, that portion of the course, then um, you are kind of on your own. Um, I mean, unless one of the TAs happens to have domain experience with that. Um, so do that at your own risk. Um, so you should at this point have gone through recitation zero, which um, I believe is up, and homework zero should be ongoing. You should be getting pretty, I mean, the course hasn't opened yet at the time of me filming this, but it hasn't started yet. But generally speaking, homework zero comes due very fast because um, we want to move on to homework one, which is where the course uh, starts to really take off. So definitely be working on those things at this point uh, if you haven't already. Um, additional logistics we'll be discussing. Uh, we will essentially be doing all of our announcements and course-related discussions on Piazza. And of course, that's the place where you can ask questions and get answers from the TAs. On the Computer infrastructure side of things, we will be giving out three different batches of Amazon uh, AWS tokens. These are voucher codes for uh, cloud compute time, which will be necessary for the course. So you'll be getting $150 total worth of um, Amazon compute time, which for the larger instances of, um, of um, the virtual machines that you'll be running, the P2 instance, I believe, that should equate to about 150 hours of compute, which should be more than enough to complete the homeworks and uh, should leave you some over, some time left over to um, work on your uh, final project. And if you do need more uh, compute time, that's something that I, I think you can discuss with the professor. I'm pretty sure we have some, some flexibility in that regard. The course is not easy. It's a lot of work. It's really a lot of work. It is sincerely a lot of work. Um, really not for chickens. It's a class that is uh, very much a Carnegie Mellon level course. Um, it is easily the most difficult course that I have ever taken in my many, many years at many institutions of college. So. Um, but I can also attest that it is one of the more valuable courses that you could take. Um, and that is a very interesting prospect where, you know, you will be better off as a person, as a computer scientist, as a, you know, data scientist, whatever it is, whatever label it is that you, you want to apply to yourself, um, if you complete this course. You will, at a minimum, understand this topic at a very deep level. Um, but wow, is it a lot of work. Um, I, the notion that one credit hour equals one hour of work in this class is shattered. No way. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's a course that should count for more than it does, but this is what it counts for. So unfortunately, it is what it is, but um, you're going to be spending you know, a significant amount of time in this class. And so as a fellow student, my recommendation would be that you uh, plan accordingly, that you, you structure your semester accordingly, that you maybe reconsider taking um, other courses that are going to be extremely difficult as well. I mean, this might not be the right semester to do that if, if you're um, very determined to take this course. Uh, we, we obviously hope that you do. Um, but you've been warned, it's a ton of work. So just kind of be prepared for that. It's a mastery-based evolution. Uh, quizzes will test your understanding of topics in the lecture. Anyone who gets an A in the course is technically ready for a deep learning job. Homework zero um, is very important. It establishes a lot of introductory level skills that you're going to need for this class. Homework one part one will also have many components intended to help you later in the course and prepare you for the course. Homework one is the easiest. Um, the homeworks will scale from there. They, they will actually get harder as the course progresses. So um, just be aware of that. Um, and do be aware that you are able to post any questions you have on Piazza. 
Uh, that's it for this lecture. Um, welcome to the course. Thank you guys so much for coming on board, and we'll see you in both the recitations and on Piazza.